Now, I've bought some silly cars in my time, but this is, on paper, the silliest of the lot. I know it looks very sensible and it ostensibly has a Volvo face, which should make it very sensible. But financially, yeah, this was crazy. I don't regret it for a minute though, because I've got, I think, one of the most interesting cars on the road in the UK. I'd seen this thing in all sorts of videos and uh, magazines, and I thought it was just stunning. There's something about when Volvo takes an ordinary saloon car and coupe ifies it that I always find really, really appealing. What about that Batoni interpretation of the 240 with the low roof? What a cool looking thing. I just thought it was stunning. And the hybridity exercise, and it dawned on me that an electric car just wasn't gonna work for me at all, but a hybrid might. But there wasn't really a proper hybrid. They were kind of get your home electric solutions, but the only real hybrid was this Polestar 1. I note, in the interim two, three years, uh, this car's been around. Most car makers are coming towards this level of thinking now, aren't they? The new C63 is very similar to this in terms of the split between electric and internal combustion engine power. Then there's the slightly thorny issue of price. This car's over 150,000 pounds. It's left-hand drive. They've not sold many in the UK. So the day that it was delivered by a really, really nice man, and I asked him the $150,000 question, I said, so how many have you sold? And he went, well, before the lockdown, we had a few orders. Um, but to be honest with you, Chris, this is the only one. And I'm not sure that situation's changed. So I've never been in a position where I own the only example of a car in the UK. And it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a badge of honor, isn't it? How many people love saying when they've got a 993 GT2, it's one of 12 right-hand drive cars, or it's super rare. I think I beat them all. This is the rarest car in the UK. I absolutely love it. So over morning, this is my standard routine. I get in, I turn it on, and I'm offered uh, hybrid mode straight away and that means that if i'm on a light throttle it'll stay electric any more than that the ice the internal combustion engine will switch on but i tend to go full electric so i got on the screen here i can go to pure now's the time to explain how the powertrain works this thing is so complicated basically it's a 400 horsepower four cylinder transversely mounted engine up front that's supercharged and turbocharged so small capacity high power output a lot of torque but quite peaky and it's got a 200 horsepower electric package that powers the rear wheels, okay? So four wheel drive combined, just over 600 horsepower. It weighs well over two tons, despite the fact there's lots of carbon fiber. It's a big, heavy, complicated thing. And I, I don't think for a minute that everyone should have one. But I tell you what, it's a surprising package. But when I leave in the morning, so I've got, you know, people around me and I want to look like I'm a, a sensible member of society and I've got some loud cars as well. I love surprising people by just creeping away like this. So I'm now in electric mode. So at the moment I'm driving a two and a half ton car that's rear wheel drive, electric only, and has 200 horsepower. So I haven't really got enough power to pull the skin off a rice pudding, but around town, it doesn't matter. And this is where the Polestar 1 really is clever. I've got right now, if I'm, if I'm fully charged, 86 miles of range. That's more than enough for me to go about my business around town. And it'll do 70, 80 miles an hour like this as well. And the range doesn't drop off that quickly when you get going in electric only mode. So I think it's fantastic. That combination of having 80 miles of electric range and also on a full tank of petrol, another 350 miles of range from the petrol engine means this thing has got seriously long GT legs. And from the outside right now, I think this is the simplest, most beautiful car shape in the UK. It's a lovely place to be. I know it's pure Volvo, but I don't spend that much time in Volvo, so to me, it feels fresh. This screen's now quite old. The seats are absolutely superb. It's unbelievable how hot they get, as does the steering wheel. It's got a big Bowers and Wilkins-based hi-fi. The criticism that I don't understand about this car that, that people use the whole time was that they kept saying, well, a Bentley feels so much more special inside. It does, but the... The mechanical package of this car is so much more impressive and more interesting. Just because it's not covered in fancy wood and have a clock made by Breitling, I couldn't, I couldn't really care. So around town, I've got now a car that doesn't make any noise, looks beautiful, and I'm very, very proud to be in. It rides really well too. It's got fully adjustable Olean's dampers, so I can take some out of it, but then you do lose 
some composure at high speed. And I, I do like driving this thing quick because it's so good. So I tend to go for a slightly knobblier town ride. And the suspension really is worth talking about. It's quite bizarre. Conventional strut up front. At the rear, there's a transverse leaf spring with two springs above it, conventional coil springs, and then these very expensive adjustable Olean stampers. So you can play with them. You really can tune this car to how you want it to drive. But I just love the serenity of electric power around town. I think anyone that's driven an electric car around town realises it is the future. It's for this sort of driving. I'm not offending anyone. I'm pure electric alone. I'm dragging more weight than I need to because it's a hybrid. I can answer all those questions. I know it's, it's not the most efficient solution. But the fact is, once I get out on the country roads or on the open road, I don't trust the electric charging network. It isn't there. I'm not trying to be deliberately obtuse and say, oh, I want to be a polluter. I really am not. But the way I live, I'm not going to compromise my life completely so I can't get around. This is, at the moment, for me, the best solution. So uh, we will emerge from town in a minute. And before we go into the open road, let's have a look around this vehicle so I can show you a few more of its tricks and quirks. It's a simple looking car, the Polestar 1, and I think that well, that's the root of its appeal for me. As cars get more and more complicated, you've got this simple shape that is somehow stunning. How do they do it? Well, I think the basic proportions of the car are quite concept in that it's very wide. It's got a wide track. It's quite short. The wheels are probably a bit too big for the shape for me, but when you follow it, it's got real presence. It's wide. It fills those wheel arches and it's got a very low roof line. So this is a letterbox windscreen. I don't think it would make it into production car because it is a very low roof line. And it does mean that headroom Certainly even for me here, I'm sitting low and I'm a, I'm a short man, as you know. In the back, I can get my two youngest, but they do have to hunch over a bit. It's a two plus two at best. And with that shortened wheelbase as well, you've got some gorgeous but subtle styling. There's this line, you'll see it, that's picked up just in front of the door handle that runs all the way back. It's a crease that just pulls the back of the car into shape. It's like a line of tension at the top of the car. It's the top of a shoulder blade for me. It's really muscly. And the front down the wing and down to the side of the car. It's so simple, but it's just so clever. It's a beautiful shape. And it really does grab people's glances. When you drive along in it, they can't understand why they want to look at the car, but they do. The glass roof, it means that the cabin's got a lovely airy feel, but I can't colour it as it's got no special stuff that makes it go dark and there's no blind. So in the summer, it's full on. It's a proper burn your head moment. And it has got this Polestar thing that I think they've all got where it projects a little Polestar logo onto the glass at night. There's not much to say about the exterior other than that. Simplicity executed to perfection. It's got a little pop-up spoiler, which you might see at speed. I've never seen it at speed, actually. Until I see the footage, I won't know what it looks like. I suspect it rather spoils the way the car looks. But for me, it's just simple Swedish design at its best. We'd like to ask for a moment of your time. But most importantly, the Polestar 1 is the best example of a car that you can't judge on a one day test drive. There's too much going on. It's so quirky. It takes so much time to get used to the way that you deploy the different modes in different situations that it would just come across as being, frankly, an overcomplicated solution to driving that no one had ever asked for. I tend to drive it in hybrid mode, which means it wobbles along in electric and then cuts in to the ICE when you want it. That means you're driving along with access to 600 horsepower, but most of the time it's probably about 400 horsepower. It means it's perfectly quick, it really does. But up on here, when you're in hybrid mode, you've got two other modes you can use. One is hold mode. That means that you never deplete the battery beyond where you are right then. So if you've got 50 miles of range, you carry on driving. It keeps 50 miles of range for when you get to the next town. It sounds like an overcomplicated function, but I use it the whole time because I want to have that electricity when I get to the next city. The other one is the charge function where you use the internal combustion engine to charge the battery. It's incredibly inefficient, but on a long run, it can help. This all sounds ridiculously complicated, and I'm sure all the EV owners out there think it's stupid. But right now, in the cold weather, I feel quite smug in this. I'm very glad it's not an EV. So we've got hold and charge explained. 
Then there's another whole world, which is power. Power is everything the whole time. And that's the one I want to talk to you about, because then suddenly I've got something that looks like a Volvo Coupe that's got 600 horsepower. Away we go now. It is really fast. This is, I'd say, about M3 quick. It's those sorts of numbers. It really is a vastly fast car. If you're using all 600 and something horsepower, you've got 400 going to the front and you've got 200 going to the rear, as I discussed earlier. So, here's an interesting question, a geek question. When you've run out of electricity and you're only using the ICE, this is a 400 horsepower front wheel drive saloon car. I don't think there's ever been one of those before, has there? What's the chassis like? Well, we've got a heavy car we've got some very, very expensive dampers. So what I tend to find is I run the car as soft as I can to make it comfortable in town, but so that it stays controlled over these sorts of A-roads. Because if, if you lose control with this much mass on board, it's going to be a handful to correct it. I never turn the systems off. And there's a reason why we're not gone to a track, because I never drive it on the track. It's not a track car. It's a GT car. It's double glazed. The sound suppression, the noise suppression is pretty good. It doesn't have that ultimately pillowy ride of a Bentley Continental. It can't quite match that, but it's more agile and it really, really is a fast car point to point. It's one of the most surprising things I've driven on the public road because it is so fast. It's much faster than I thought it was going to be. And the torque, that sort of instant, oh, I'll have a quick look and get up behind that car to overtake. If you touch the throttle, it gives you electricity and that torque just fires you up so quickly. So impressive. And the noise, yeah, the noise is largely terrible. It's uh, four cylinders, turbocharged, supercharged. It's not a great noise, but that's not why I bought it. I bought it because it's clever. So cross country, it's a real surprise. On the motorway, it's even better. On the motorway, this has got such fantastic stability that when the weather's poor, this is the car of everything I own I choose to use. It's just so stable. One of the downsides, there are a couple, not many. The rear seats are smaller than I thought they were going to be. We've had a few whoopsies. It went back because it had some problems with the door handle not shutting properly and then something went wrong with the battery. And you expect that when you've got the only one they've sold in the UK. It's always going to be a bit complicated. My biggest gripe at this time of year is that the heated rear windscreen elements just aren't powerful enough to clean the rear window. I find that quite odd. In a Volvo badged car, I thought everything they did was turbocharged heating. The seat certainly is, and the steering wheel burns your hands when you put the button on, but not the rear window. And of course, there's the thorny issue of the price of the thing, £150,000. What's it worth now? Not £150,000, but this has been, for me, a really worthwhile experiment. Because if I look at a normal journey of mine. This is the best car I've owned because I can leave silently in electric mode. I can have fun and use the IC on the open road and on the motorway. I have no range anxiety. And yet in town, I feel I'm doing the right thing. I'm not polluting. So I think Volvo Polestar were ahead of the game. It's quite telling that three, four years after this thing was launched, we've got an AMG C63 that's already come out as a hybrid, the next M5 will be, I'm sure, and the following M3, I'm sure, as well, because it makes sense for a performance car. <laughs>